together and that I will not be praying this by myself, but you guys all promised that you would be active uh, prayers with me. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Please. Spirit, name one God, amen. Make us worthy to pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one through Christ Jesus our Lord, for as a kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us give thanks to the beneficent and merciful God, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Helped us, guarded us, accepted us into Spare us, support us, and has brought us this hour. Let us also ask him, the Lord, our God, the Father of holy day and all the days of our life. O oh, Master, Lord, the God, the Pantocrator, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you for everything concerning everything and in everything. For you have covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to yourself, spared us, supported us, and has brought us to this hour. Therefore, we ask and entreat your goodness, O lover of mankind, to grant us to complete the holy day and all the days of our life and all peace with your fear. All envy, all temptation, all the work of Satan. The counsel of the wicked men and the rising up of the enemies hidden and manifest. Take them away from us and from all your people. Holy place. But those things which are good and profitable do provide for us. For it is you who have given us the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and upon all the power of the enemy. And lead us not to temptation, but the us from the evil one, through the grace, compassion, and love of mankind of your only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The glory the Father, and the dominion and the worship are due to you, with him and the Holy Spirit, you are in life, who is of with you. Now at all times, and to the ages of all ages, amen. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your great mercies, according to the multitudes of your power. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my iniquity and sin at all times before me. Against you only have I sinned and done this evil before you, and that you might be found in this For behold, I was conceived in iniquities and sin, and my mother conceived me. He shall sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be purified. He shall wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. He shall make me and humble bones may rejoice. Turn away your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, or in your right spirit from my own parts. Get away from your parts and do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your directing spirit. Then I shall teach transgressors your ways and I shall turn to you. Deliver me from blood, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall rejoice in your righteousness. O oh Lord, you shall open my lips, and my mouth shall shut for your praise. For if you desire a sacrifice, I would have given it. You do not take pleasure with our offerings, and the sacrifices of God is a broken spirit. Open and humbled heart, God shall not despise. Do good, and the only pleasure is honor. Then you shall be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness and honor. Then they shall work gas. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity that we may come into your home, Lord. I ask, Lord, the same way that you met us during the liturgy, Lord, and that you provided yourself for us in the Eucharist, Lord. I ask that you come and you meet us upstairs as well, Lord, for we know that you are a living God, not a God of 2,000 years ago, Lord, but a God who is still very, very active today, Lord. So I ask that your spirit fill this upper room, Lord. I ask that you wrestle with hearts, Lord. I ask that what we're talking about right now in this in the, in this season of the Nativity, Lord, is, is directly applicable to how we are living now, Lord. I ask that you be glorified, Lord. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your people, Lord. And I ask that you give us tangible action items, Lord, and exactly how much you love us and how we can walk in that love. And I ask these things in sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, Te Toko, St. Mary, all your saints and martyrs. Here's we cry out with one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> I'm holding. Test, test, test. 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 Are we good? Sounds good.
Can you guys, everybody can hear me okay? All right, sounds like a deal. All right, so. All right, so who remembers what series we're covering right now? It's always a feel-good question for me because it remind, reminds me how, like, <laughs> how much can change. Well, technically, it's been two weeks, so I'll give you guys, uh, you know, the benefit of the doubt. But we're actually, um, and actually, actually, before I do that, um, just a reminder that, like, so obviously last week we did not have the meeting, and I just want to remind everybody that the first Sunday of every month has been carved out and is for fellowship, so we will not be having our meeting, but it's a good opportunity for us to all come upstairs, um, including all of the people that don't, don't come upstairs. But um, just remember that the first Sunday of every month, we're gonna be having like fellowship meal up here together. So encourage everybody from downstairs to make it upstairs so that we can all enjoy each other's company. And then we'll have three more weeks, you know, to kind of go through this. But um, we are actually doing something that's very seasonally appropriate right now and we're covering the nativity. Um, and we're going off of this book from Abuna Mata Meskin or um, Father Matthew the Poor called Love Took Flesh. And it's a beautiful, beautiful book. And what it is, it's, it's basically, let me see how many letters. He's got 15, 15 letters that he wrote throughout, like, um, that were published. And these were letters that he was writing to other, bro uh, other brother monks at like different monasteries, and they're all based off of the theme of the nativity. So we've been kind of run running through that. And, um, and it's very nice because even the one that, that we're covering today, which is, it's this chapter called Revo Rejoice, for the divine gift we are given. And it's, it's literally less than two pages. It's a very, very short read. But it really, when I started thinking about it, it just opens up your mind. It's almost like opening up Pandora's box a little bit and you just start having all of these thoughts about the nativity and how much of a game changer the nativity really was. Um, and he started off with this thought where he was thinking about Imagine you have the, whole, the Old Testament, you have the whole Old Testament, and we all know that the Old Testament sometimes can be a little bit gloomy, um, a lot of stuff going on there, uh, God that you see a side of God there that um, is a little bit different, but he opens up when you start talking about the nativity, how everything changes. We're talking in the very, very early parts of the Gospels and in the New Testament, it says, for the first time after man, the fall of man, which is Genesis 3, for the first time after the fall of man, man hears a voice from heaven and is comforted. And his heart is called to peace and joy. So he's just talking about like even in the very, very, very beginning of the New Testament, how much of a huge difference that is compared to what we were seeing in the Old Testament. And, and that angels, the angels and heavens themselves are calling out and they're asking for peace and joy. How great a day was the nativity that everything changed that much. Night and day difference from the day of nativity. And it became a day of comfort for all mankind. So when I'm telling you that like the nativity changed everything, I really mean the nativity changed everything. Like I even talked about two weeks ago, the nativity, you know, it basically brought into the whole like, you know, BCAD. It even changed our timeline. It changed everything. And that day was the first day that there was a pathway open for us to allow the power of joy to overcome the sorrows. Because if you look at the Old Testament, you don't see as much joy in the Old Testament. In, Testament. in the Old Testament, you see sorrows and troubles and consequences and sin and death and, and all of this. And if, and, and if that doesn't convict you, think about the Old Testament. And a lot of the times, even when we speak Old Testament versus New Testament, one of the sayings that we hear all of the time is the God of the Old Testament or the God of the New Testament. And we think about the God of the Old Testament was full of anger. And I'm going to tell you this. Did we have different gods in the Old Testament and the New Testament? Because we got to be honest that there, there was only one God and he was the same God during the Old and the New. So we've got to reconcile that. Because we know it was the same God. So let's understand something. Because if we see, if it appears that it's different gods in the Old Testament and the New Testament, why the big difference? And I want to challenge you with the thought that do you know what the big difference is between the Old Testament and the New Testament? It was the nativity. It was that one day. It was that one act. right? It was that one fact that when Christ took, took flesh, it changed everything. 
Because when you read the Old Testament, what do you come across? We find books full of woes and sorrows and threats. And if you don't believe me, go to the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. And it was just chapters after chapters of chapters of warning, right? Conviction of sin, telling them that this is your sin and this is your consequence. And this is the way that this is going to go. That book, honestly, if you're going to be honest with yourself, if you read that book and you're not terrified, then you didn't read it correctly. Because there's no shortage of threats and consequences about our sins and our failures. And the fact that God is an all-loving God, but he's also an all-holy God. And that sin comes with its consequences, and the consequences of sin are death. And I have to be honest that many times I feel that when we compare the Old Testament to the New Testament, and we know that the Old Testament is full of laws, sins, consequences. The New Testament is full of love, grace, forgiveness. And I feel like even right now, as workers of the 11th hour, that pendulum swung way to the other side completely. And a lot of the times we forget that the God of the Old Testament, which is still the God that exists, that he does hate sin. And that sin does have a consequence. And that he is all holy. And there's no way that we can, that we can live sinful lives and still be in communion with him. I feel like there's a part of us when the pendulum swung, we forgot how we should have a healthy fear of God. And that healthy fear of God, that what if that's where it all began? Like that's where it starts. Proverbs 9, 10. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Also Psalm 24, uh, 25, 14. It says the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. And I feel like a lot of times in the world that we're living in, that the idea of fear of God has passed. And we don't have a fear of God anymore. Now we have the, the God will forgive me. God is okay. I will do it and I will confess it anyways. And then his, his, his blood will cover me. And although that, that, that's great and it's true, but we need the fear of God. We must have a, just a healthy fear of God. And I challenge you that personally, like, you know, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but the love of God is the beginning of relationships. And I think sometimes that we, we miss that point. In 1 John 4, 18, it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made in perfect love. And I think that there's this important concept that we have to understand because a lot of the times we don't talk about fear of God anymore. We gravitate away from that because it doesn't feel good. But the fear of God gets us to fall in line. It gets us to understand what's really important. It gets us to understand that we can't do whatever we want without a consequence on the other side, right? But love, but love, that is the key factor that will get you to, to not sin. And love is a completely different motivator because when it comes to how much we love God, when we love God, then we choose him above our sin. Because fear of God, which I know is very real for us because right now we're all, you know, we're in, we're in a church fast and we know that we love non-fasting food, right? So I'm going to ask you is like when you are fasting, what is driving you towards the fast, right? Are we saying no to things we shouldn't be having because we know it's bad and we shouldn't, and it's kind of like the fear of God? Or are we pushed towards our fast because of the fact that we love God and we know that increasing our fast, being strict on our fast, will drive us into a deeper relationship with Him. And we will spiritually benefit, ultimately, in a deeper relationship with Him to see Him in a way that we typically don't see Him, right? Because the, the, the motive behind both of those things are crazy different because it ends up not being a matter of consequence, but a matter of relationship. But I'm gonna tell you, so I just spouted off, you know, two verses in the Old Testament and one verse in the New Testament, right? What do you think the difference was? Because in the Old Testament, it talked about fear. In the New Testament, it talked about love. So what was the difference? This should be an easy one. It was the nativity. The nativity was the difference, right? Because the nativity, when Christ took flesh, it changed everything. It brought an entire new light 
to a dark world. He is the true light. And when he came, he brought all of that light with him and it changed everything. It opened a new destiny. Everything changed the day that Christ took flesh and came and was born. You see, and, and, and I love this thing because there's so many times that you look at the Bible and we have the hindsight 2020. We could see it all, right? Like I said, we're the workers of the 11th hours, right? You have the workers from the first, the third, the sixth, and they, and they were working hard and they didn't have full scope of what was going on. We squeezed in in the 11th hour and we have all of the history to kind of see that perfect personality of God and how he's been working from the very beginning, right? Because Simeon, when he sees Christ, when, when, the, when the, the Holy Family brings him into the temple, Simeon prophesies Luke 2.32 and he says, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. It was his plan from the very, very, very beginning. And if we were honest, we have to thank God for that because who are we? We are the Gentiles. A lot of the times we think that we are like the, we're the oldest, right? We have a sense of pride. We have a lot of richness in our church. We have a lot of great things to look back about our church, but don't be deceived. We are the Gentiles. We are the ones that snuck in at the end. We are not the Jews, which were God's promised people in the Old Testament. But I love a God that from the very, very beginning had a plan to include us. It was the plan from the, and it was a great plan. It was not even imaginable. But when we look back and we see the fingerprints of Christ all over the Old Testament, there was no way that he didn't knew, know what he was doing from the very, very beginning. And I was thinking about this, right? And you start looking back and you see Christ in the Old Testament. You see this plan in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they could have never fathomed what God was going to do. But when you look back, you see it in Isaiah 41 and 2. It says, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that the warfare has ended and her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received the Lord's hand double all of her sins. What could that be anything other than the nativity? It couldn't be anything other because there was no other way that we could have doubled all of our sins, or have forgiveness for all of our sins with the grace, right, that we've received from the Lord's hand. What is the Lord's hand other than the fact that Christ himself when he came down and was born among us. And the nativity was a game changer because that was the day that God's plan to salvation came to fruition here on earth. The only way, the only reason he came is he knew how it was ending and he knew it was the only way that we can reconcile. A day of redemption from God who was issued by the only one who could issue it, which was God the Father. And I love this quote that Abuna Mehta wrote in there. He says, mankind plays no part in it. We had nothing to do with it, except by offering the body of St. Mary to use as a tabernacle to dwell in it. Because he had a plan that he wanted to live out. He had a plan that he wanted to reconcile his people to himself. And there was nothing that, he could, there's nothing that we could do to aid him other than offer St. Mary as a vessel. And then I started thinking about it and I started thinking about, you know, imagine how mind-blowing this was at the time. Because if you, look at the, if you look at the Old Testament, could anyone have seen this coming? Of course not. There's no way anyone could have ever seen this coming. I started thinking about it. Imagine the angels, you know, it said that the angels proclaimed, right? And the angels showed up outside the manger. Can you imagine what the angels were thinking at this time? They were thinking, how? How? How leave the throne of glory? Why leave the heavens where everyone is praising to be come down and to be born a human in a manger with no possessions and even the rags that you were, that you were wrapped in were dirty? Blows their mind. Can you imagine the Old, the, the Old Testament prophets seeing all of this happen? The Old Testament prophets who were, these were the ones like, you know, you look at Jeremiah where Jeremiah is, is brimstone and he's saying that this is bad and you guys are going to be punished and repent of your sins and all of this other stuff. And then he looks towards the throne of God and he sees that Christ has left. And he says, where did he go? Well, he went down to earth. Why did he go down there? To reconcile his people, to be crucified on a cross, to shed his blood, to be the perfect sacrifice. Can you imagine the characters of the Old Testament trying to wrap their mind around that? They couldn't. They couldn't. Right? And then I started thinking about the actual acts 
that happened while Christ was walking the earth. And if heaven had a window into that, how would they would be receiving that, right? I started thinking about the St. Peter after the denial. Prophets of the Old Testament were thinking, oh, he's done. He's done. There's a stiff consequence coming for that, right? He's going to be cast into hell. There is no way. But to see the restoration of St. Peter, how it must have blown their mind, right? I think about John 8, the woman who was caught in the act of adultery in front of the all-holy God. And to think if, if heaven had a window into that and they were looking down, they're saying, oh, she's, she's done according to the law. She needs to be stoned, right? Like no one can save her now. She's too guilty. She's too bad. Her sin was too big and it was public. And then to see God Almighty, the holy of all holies, look down and forgive her and restore her. Like, guys, like this should blow our mind. It should blow our mind. And I think a lot of the times, like I said, the pendulum swung too far, right? Where we, we hear these stories and we totally think that they're normal. We think that it's totally not a big deal. It was a huge deal. Ultimately and lastly, Christ himself, knowing that he was innocent, knowing that he was being crucified. You have all the Old Testament looking back at this. And I guarantee you, they probably thought, oh man, these Romans are going to get it. Oh, the Jews are going to get it. This is, this is bad, right? Like we know what happens. We know the law. We know the people who gave false witness. We know all of that stuff. But how can you do that to the all holy and perfect God? But heaven looking down on the cross, what do they hear? Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. They know not what they do. And I, I'm positive that this blew all of their mind. They couldn't understand it. How such an all-holy, all-righteous God who hates sin so much at the same time could love so much. And I think that we forget that too, right? We forget like this amount of love, this mercy, this grace that's extended from the all-holy God. And he deserves more from us. Like, it should blow your mind. Like this whole idea of the nativity should blow your mind because he knew what he was signing up for from day one, right? Because his birth changed everything. Not only did he open up that door for salvation, not only did that was day one checked off the list of the things that needed to pass for him to be able to reconcile with us or for us to be able to reconcile with him, right? He didn't just do that, but he left us with the perfect example. When we look at the pages of the Gospels and we see his interactions, we see the love, we see the grace, we see the forgiveness, we see the interaction. He left us the perfect example. He showed us exactly how much he loved us. Did he hold back anything? He didn't hold back a single thing. You know, and because of that, we have access to his righteousness. Because even on our best day, we will never get into heaven based on our own, but we need to depend on his. We need to depend on his blood. One of the things that I think about all of the time was when you start thinking about what did Christ possess on earth? Well, it wasn't a whole lot, was it? Right? To be honest with you, even, even his clothes were stolen from him at the very, very end. He didn't even have that. And the only two things that he had were his body and his blood. And even those he did not withhold from us. And it's what he still offers us every single day. But now, that nativity, it changed everything. It opened a whole new door for us. It honestly, it opened up a whole new covenant. And that we should be very, very honored and blessed and humbled that we are actual partakers of this new covenant. And we became receivers of the gifts that he was giving us. And how generous is his communion? How easy is our role in things? It wasn't our blood that was shed. Right? But it was his blood. It was precious. It was valuable. And it paid our price. Don't think that you had anything to do with it. But it was his blood that paid our price. And how could this even be possible? The only way it could be possible was the season that we're in right now. Thanks to the nativity. It was the plan. You go all the way back to Genesis 3. Very, very beginning. First couple pages of the Bible. Right? And it shows us that this was his plan from the very, very beginning. Because it said that Adam and Eve covered themselves with leaves. 
And we all know that the leaves were temporary. Those leaves could never cover them. It was a very temporary solution, but it was their best efforts. And it was God basically saying that your best efforts will always be temporary. And that's applicable to Adam and Eve in the garden when they tried covering themselves up with leaves, and it's, it's applicable for every single one of us here, right? That our best efforts will always be temporary. It will never be enough and it will never work. But I love Genesis 3.21 because it says that also for Adam and his wife, the Lord, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. And I think there's a lot of things that we will just kind of we'll read in the Bible and we'll blow by it. And we don't, we don't pay a lot of attention to it, right? But that's such a powerful verse right there because he made them tunics of skin and clothed them. Now, the tunics of skin, temporary or did they last? They lasted, right? Like if you know if you have a leather jacket, that thing can last for as long as you live, right? But what's the beauty in the leather? What's the beauty of the, the tunics of skin? There had to be sacrifice. There had to be sacrifice. And he knew for me to cover them, something would have to die. There would have to be bloodshed. He knew it would require blood. Ultimately, he knew it would require his own blood. In Genesis 3, when they fell, he knew the solution to that. You know, he killed an animal to give him skin. But from that point on, the nativity was ingrained. And he knew that his blood would be shed and it would be required through the nativity. And it's that blood, it's that body that bears our weakness, but also gives us our strength. And I challenge all of us that we should not be walking around in weakness, but we should be walking around in strength, because that is what God gave us. Because based on the nativity, he has sanctified our nature. And our weaknesses, as St. Paul writes, that our weaknesses are, are window for his glory. He sanctified our nature. His weak, our weakness, our strength, and our sin has dwindled and it has been replaced by his righteousness. So guys, I'm just asking you guys that in this season that we know what we're fasting for, that we know that the day that Christ came to this earth, everything changed. That's what we're celebrating. That's what we're preparing ourselves for. And when we're fasting this fast, what's the prayer? The prayer is the same way that nativity changed everything 2,000 years ago. I ask that you change everything this year. Let me have the growth. Let me have the intimacy with you. Let me challenge myself. Let me experience the blessings of the nativity because the nativity was just the beginning. But what a glorious and bright beginning it was. And I ask that when we are celebrating this fast that it is the beginning of a whole new chapter of our lives as well where we experience the fullness and the riches and everything that Christ came to give us. Amen? Okay, let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, because you paid the price, Lord. You did things that were just unthinkable just to reconcile us with you. And Lord, so many times, Lord, we chase things, Lord, but they never fulfill, they never satisfy. Matter of fact, they just... They remind us how empty and how thirsty and how hungry we really are, Lord. But you've promised us that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake, they shall be filled. So, Lord, in a time like this, Lord, set our minds on your nativity. Let us remember, Lord, how there was, it was such a dark time, but your nativity broke the darkness, Lord. That your bright light changed everything, Lord. And I ask that the same way that it changed the church 2,000 years ago, Lord, I ask that it change our hearts, our minds, Lord, that you draw us into your light. Lord, we don't want you just to be born in a manger, Lord, but I ask that you just be born in every single one of us, Lord. Let your voice be loud. Let your, let your communication with us be strong, Lord. I ask you that you draw us near you, Lord, because many times we run. We run towards the darkness, Lord. We should be scared of it, Lord. But ultimately, I don't know why, Lord, many times we shy away from you. So I ask, Lord, that during this fast, Lord, that you just let us, just give us, give us a little bit more of your light. Because we know that your light will shine as bright as we allow it to, Lord. So I ask that you just open our eyes to that. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord. I ask that you forgive us our sins, Lord. I ask that you teach us how to hate our sin. And that you draw us closer and closer to you, Lord. 
I ask these things, lift in the sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, the Theotoko St. Mary, Lord. All your saints, all your martyrs, here as we pray out, saying with one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, who is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.